And I didn't know that. I didn't notice it. So there are some traditions where the pastor starts off uh, the morning by greeting the congregation by saying, peace be with you. And the congregation responds, and also with you. Well, I'm reminded of the pastor who was having some trouble with his microphone, and, uh, and he was up front, and he said, I think there's something wrong with this. The people thought he had started, and they said, and also with you. <laughs> so if the microphone goes out halfway through the sermon this morning, wave your hands or do something, let me know so that we can, so that we can fix it and everything will be fine. I won't be offended in the least, uh, and, and, and unless you don't want to listen, and then you can... Okay, thank you, Lord, that uh, <laughs> the microphone went off. It's good to see you back. We've had a wonderful week this past week. As, uh, as Andrew mentioned earlier, my, my wife's brother, uh, also a David, uh, showed up on our doorstep uh, with his wife on Monday, and we've spent the week uh, introducing them to Edinburgh and Dalkeith and uh, going around the city. And of course, no trip into Edinburgh is complete uh, without a visit to the castle uh, or going down to the end of the Royal Mile and seeing the palace. Uh, and of course, one has to stop at St. Giles. I love walking through St. Giles, magnificent uh, cathedral. And I was doing some reading to, and, and discovered that a, a worshiping presence has been on that spot since 854, 854, people have been worshiping God on the spot of St. Giles Cathedral. And just imagine the people who have worked on that cathedral down through the centuries. It's not difficult for me to imagine that there were some people who spent their entire lives working on that cathedral never to see the finished product. And I can also easily imagine that during a building project of such a grand scale that there were times when things didn't go quite right. And so what happens if you're working on a little corner of the cathedral and you think that something is not going right? Well, you have to find somebody who is in charge. And you would have to ask them, Hey, I think there's something wrong over here. And that person would come and inspect what was happening and then make the adjustments or the corrections so that the project could continue. Now, at such times, the confusion that surfaces because something is askew would be dealt with by an understanding of the person who is in charge. And so there would be a little bit of comfortableness amidst that confusion. Because you have faith in the person who is in charge. Comfortable confusion. I may not understand exactly what's going on, but I believe that the project manager does. And so I will continue on, even though I don't quite understand exactly what's happening. I kind of think that was what was happening with the prophet Habakkuk. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them. We're still in the first chapter of Habakkuk. Last week, we uh, kind of set it in its historical context. Habakkuk is confused. He doesn't understand what's going on in the world, and he cries out to God. And those were the opening verses that we looked at last week. The How, how long, Lord, what is going on? How long is it going to happen? Why are you allowing these things to happen? And God answers him. And we find God's answer 
in this first chapter, starting with verse 5. And I love this verse, one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. As, as God addresses the concerns and the confusion of Habakkuk. Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your day that you wouldn't believe even if you were told. I love that. God is doing something in our midst. Even if he told us, we wouldn't believe it. This is what Habakkuk needed to hear. But then God goes on to explain. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, who sweep across the whole earth, seizing dwelling places not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law unto themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like a vulture swooping to devour. And they come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like the desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They deride kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. They build earthen ramps to capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own strength is their God. Throughout Scripture, we read that God has a plan, that God is at work, and that His plan is unfolding each and every day, His plan unfolding in each and every one of our lives. And there is nothing that we can do that will ultimately thwart God's plan for our lives or for this world. Now, I freely admit that there are times when we, can, when we can make mistakes, when we can sin, and we hurt ourselves, and we hurt those around us. But even in that, God is still sovereign. And He is at work in ways that we will never understand, never comprehend, this side of eternity. Habakkuk was wondering, God, what are you doing? How come you're, you're allowing me to see all of this injustice and all of these ugly things happen? And God answers him, but not the way he expected. God answers him and says, I'm doing a work, you wouldn't believe it, even if I told you. And then he goes on and he talks about the Babylonians. At this point, the nations are in chaos. And the, the Babylonians are on the rise. They are, they are going to defeat the Assyrians. If you remember your Bible stories from when you were children, do you remember the story of Jonah? Remember Jonah? Jonah was at, well, not asked, he was told by God to go to Nineveh, which is the capital of, the, uh, of Assyria, and tell them that he was going to destroy, wipe out Nineveh in 40 days. Jonah doesn't want to go. In fact, he goes the other direction. Why? Because the people of Nineveh were mean. They were nasty people. And, and Jonah was afraid that if he went to Nineveh and told them that the Lord was going to destroy them in 40 days, that they would do something like, I don't know, repent. And if they repented, then God would relent and not destroy them. Jonah didn't want to take that chance. He wanted God to wipe out the people of Nineveh. The people of Nineveh met their match with the people of Babylon. And God tells Habakkuk, 
that he is going to use the people of Babylon to bring justice, to deal with the nations. And and I have trouble wrapping my mind around that. How is it that God can use evil in the world today for his purposes? When I think about that, I'm drawn to the 55th chapter of the book of Isaiah. A brilliant chapter. I recommend all of you go home and read it today. In that chapter, the word of the Lord comes to Isaiah and says, My ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts and my ways higher than your ways. But just as the rain comes and it, and it waters the ground so that the seed can grow and yield its crop, so my word also goes forth and accomplishes the purposes for which I sent it. When I ask questions of what God is doing. And I try to wrap my mind around what's happening. I can still be a little confused, but I go to verses like that in the book of Isaiah, and I recognize that God is doing, His ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And the same for Habakkuk. Habakkuk is grateful to hear this word, grateful to know that God is still sovereign, grateful to know that God is not sitting back waiting for something to break so that he can go and fix it, nor is God sitting on the sidelines quietly watching life unfold. No, 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 no. Habakkuk now realizes that God is in fact in control, that God is still sovereign, that he is doing a work. He's confused, but there's a comfortableness in that confusion. Because even though Habakkuk doesn't understand, he knows that God is still sovereign. And we hear that in his answer as Habakkuk responds back to God in verse 12. O Lord, are you not from everlasting? O my God, my Holy One, we will not die. Within that rhetorical question is a statement of faith by Habakkuk that he recognizes that God is sovereign, that God is still in control, that God is still at work within this world. But there's more than that. As he writes, my God, my Holy One, we will not die. What in the world is he talking about there? I would dare say that many, if not all of us, have experienced the loss of a loved one. And we hurt, we ache inside. And yet through the resurrection, we know that death is not a destination, but a doorway. And I believe that in this statement, Habakkuk is foreshadowing the resurrection. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will never die. Oh yes, we will go through a transition. And I've often said that death is only a problem for those of us who are still alive. For those who shuffle off this mortal coil, they enter into the presence of God. For all eternity. That is the hope that is ours in the resurrection. When Jesus rose from the grave, not only does he authenticate who he is and all of his promises, but he answers that most important question for us. Is there life beyond this grave? And the answer is yes. Death is not a destination, but a doorway. O Lord, are you not from everlasting, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. O Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. O Rock, you have ordained them, the people from Babylon, 
to punish. Your eyes, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate long. Why then can you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made men like fish in the sea, like creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls them up with the hooks, catches them in his net, and gathers them in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet, for by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest of food. Is he to keep on emptying his nets, destroying nations without mercy? Habakkuk is still struggling. He is still confused. But there is comfort in that confusion because he knows that God is still at work. How can God use what is evil for his purposes? This is not the first time that we read of such a thing, nor will it be the last. I'm reminded of my favorite narrative in the Old Testament, the story of Joseph. Joseph had a handful of brothers, older brothers. I loved the little girl this morning. What makes you sad when my brothers are a teensy bit mean with me? (laughs) I hear you, sister. I had an older brother and an older sister. I can't imagine having ten older brothers, nor could I imagine having a father that shed all his affection on me to the extent that he ignored the other ten. And how do you think they felt about that? Oh, hey, this is great. Dad likes Joseph. Big deal, right? No. They're jealous. They're angry. Are they mean to Joseph? Oh, absolutely. What happens to Joseph when he goes out to check on them? They sell him into slavery. They sell their brother into slavery. Was that a good thing to do? Not by any stretch of the imagination. And yet that began a journey for Joseph that ultimately brought him into the Pharaoh's palace where he was put in charge over everything. And when the famine hit, Egypt had food. And can you imagine what went through Joseph's mind when he saw his brothers come to buy food in Egypt. He plays with them a little bit. But ultimately, he reveals himself to them. And when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, they say, oh, yay, we're saved. This is going to be wonderful. Oh, Joe, no hard feelings, right? No, they were afraid. They were afraid that their brother, who was now in a position of power, was going to take his revenge. But you see, Joseph wasn't after revenge. In fact, he says to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I'm reminded of the words that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. All things, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called together according to his purposes. And of course, I don't think there's a one of us that would think that putting an innocent man to death would be a good thing. And yet the Romans did just that. The week that Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the people cheered. And it wasn't but five days later that they started calling for his crucifixion. That wasn't a good thing by any stretch of the imagination. That the Romans would permit an innocent person to die. And yet through the death of Christ, the ultimate good that came out of that This is surpassing grace of God and the reconciliation of the world with God through Jesus Christ. That is our hope. And so we look back on the Babylonians 
And we look back on Habakkuk and we say with Habakkuk, Lord, how can you do this? We need only look at history to understand that God is able to redeem absolutely anything in our lives, good or bad, for his glory, for his honor, and for his purposes. We look at the world today, particularly the Middle East. Last week we talked about the threats of, of Iran against the, the, the tankers in the Straits of Hormuz. And then this past week a British tanker was seized. And we wonder, God, how can you allow this evil to exist? We read about the Iranians, we read of, and we hear about Hezbollah, we hear about Hamas, we hear about the Taliban and ISIS, and we wonder, Lord, these are evil people, how can you allow them to survive? Could it be that God is using them to further his kingdom? Could it be that God is still sovereign, that he is still in control? And he's using things that are unimaginable to us. I was reminded by my wife that we have friends who serve in the Middle East. They live in Lebanon. They're working amongst the Syrian refugees right now. And you know what they are witnessing? They are witnessing more Muslims come to Jesus Christ today than ever before. Dreams and visions. The number one tool in evangelism in the Middle East and in North Africa is, have you had the dream yet? And they can tell by the response in their face whether or not they've had the dream. Because Jesus is visiting people in dreams and visions. And it, open up, it opens up a dialogue in which they can share with him about Jesus Christ. And to come to Jesus Christ in the Middle East is no small thing. They call them the walking martyrs, because it is illegal in the Middle East to reject Islam and embrace any other faith. And yet God is at work in our midst in ways that we wouldn't believe even if we were told. On a smaller scale, I had some experience with this at home. For the past five years, five years, I have been working on a project to build a new youth center right across the street from our sanctuary. Oh, I have worked with architects. I have worked with uh, noise consultants, with air quality engineers, with, with, uh, uh, with water consultants, uh, building permits, invested over, well over $150,000 into this project and was convinced by the city and by the architect that if we got through all this process, that the project would be approved. And at the last minute, at the last minute, a small group of citizens arose, and they told lies, and they distorted the truth. They said that we were trying to introduce a Trojan horse and that we didn't want to put in a youth center. That was the last thing that we wanted to do. That we were planning on putting in a huge banquet center and sufficiently scared the people next door and had sufficient impact on the city council that the project was voted down. Now, I would be lying to you if I said I wasn't disappointed. But at the same time, I recognized that God is still sovereign. And if he wants that youth center to be built, it will be built. And then I was reminded of King David who wanted to build a glorious temple to the Lord. And the Lord, through Nathan, said, David, you're not the one to build this temple. Your son will build the temple. And so I took a step back and said, okay, I don't need to build it. I had the vision. In the midst of the chaos of our world today, in the midst of not knowing what is going on, we like Habakkuk can stand firm in our faith. And after hearing God's answer and, God, and Habakkuk follows up with a further question, he closes off his statement by saying, I will stand my watch and station myself on the ramparts. And I will look to see what God will say to me. 
and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Though he was confused, he was comforted because he trusted that God was still in control. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are sovereign, that you are in control, that you are at work in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. And Lord, I'm mindful that today in the sanctuary, there may be people who are struggling with life issues, wondering where you are, struggling, Lord, confused, not understanding. And I pray that the message of Habakkuk would penetrate their hearts and that you would seal that message with the power of your Holy Spirit, that all who are present today might know that you are sovereign, that you are at work, and that we are a part of what you are doing. We'll give you the glory, we'll give you the honor as your plan unfolds and our faith becomes sight. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.